I was at Harvard University for 30 years, okay? 30 years. Claudine Gay came to Harvard University eight years ago, okay? She doesn't own Harvard University, even though she's the president. I feel that this is my home. And if someone ca comes to my home and violates my principles, I don't leave home because of that. I will try to change the intellectual climate we live in for the better. First off, I want to welcome you. And it's been about three months since we spoke. Uh, we spoke last for your wonderful second book, Interstellar. And a lot has happened uh, since that time. And I cannot ignore kind of the mastodon trampling through the room and not ask you, as, uh, as, as someone who was born in Israel, who was raised on farm in Israel, who is uh, one of the most preeminent scientists in the world, but also a very proud Jew, and as am I. And I, I don't make any apologies for that. I was in Israel a mere uh, two weeks before the October 7th Hamas terrorist attacks. I was in Tel Aviv. I was in southern Israel. I was in Jerusalem. And I was very close because it was Rosh Hashanah, Avi. I actually got to be very close with a lot of uh, Palestinians, Arabs, because they were the ones working while Jews were enjoying their holiday. So I actually had many meals with, with Palestinians, um, shared many rides with them on public and, and private transport, and uh, had no inkling of what would happen. And the, uh, the insight that I think we need to start with before we turn to to Harvard, and then eventually to the uh, the subject that I originally invited you to speak about, which is your area of expertise, which is this uh, interstellar meteorite, which has received some pushback from the community, as, as happens. Um, some of it fair, some of it possibly not fair. Uh, we'll talk about that. So three things on the agenda today. First of all, Avi, um, I need to give you a chance to just share your thoughts as, as a man of science, as a man of conscience, and as a Jew. How have you been dealt affected by the events of October 7th? Well, let me first clarify, this is not a war between uh, the Palestinians and Israel. It's a war between the Hamas and Israel. And there is a clear distinction because uh, given the charter of the Hamas, there cannot be peace. There cannot be a two state solution. Uh, the Hamas calls for uh, the removal of Israel, for killing all citizens of Israel. There is no room for compromise. And therefore, anyone that uh, sides with uh, a terrorist organization which basically aims to annihilate uh, the state of Israel, kill all, all the Jews rather than reach a compromise, is basically advocating violence. Uh, and that has nothing to do with political opinion. I want to clarify that. Um, you know, uh, my wife uh, is uh, uh, peace seeking. Uh, Israeli, and she was always uh, on the left advocating for finding a resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian co uh, conflict. But uh, what happened on October 7th was uh, rape of women, killing of babies, uh, one of whom, you know, the, I, I will not get into the details. There is actually a film about it, but it was the uh, most violent uh, act of barbarism uh, against humanity, basically killing people uh, that have nothing to do with a military conflict. These are civilians at their homes. And um, in a way, you know, it's sort of like uh, the reckoning after 9-11, you know, we should all condemn such an act. Now, then you ask yourself, how is it possible that uh, 25 student organizations at Harvard University would cheer up and say that the victims uh, deserved it? Irrespective of political views, nobody should celebrate killing of innocent civilians for any political purpose. And so that is a distortion of uh, the moral compass. And you ask yourself, how did we get there? Well, it's obviously a result of social media where uh, that polarizes society. But you can't just uh, relate it to that. that there is something wrong with academia. And yesterday, I was actually in Washington, D.C. I was jogging at 6 a.m. Uh, on the Arlington Bridge uh, uh, with a backdrop of a beautiful uh, sunrise. Uh, and it, uh, a, few, a few hours later, uh, Harvard's president, along with two other university presidents, uh, 
uh, was testifying uh, in Capitol Hill, where I, I met with other people. Um, and she was asked, Claudine Gay was asked, whether uh, uh, calling for a genocide of Jews should be considered harassment, yes or no. And she said, it depends on the context. And not only she, but the other two presidents. That's and true. to me, that is a terrible message because there is no doubt that the genocide of any group of people should be condemned. She should have said no, but instead she said, if it doesn't translate into action, then uh, you know we have to deal on, with it on a case-by-case -case basis. And what does it mean, action, that Jews will be killed on campus only then would you consider it as a violation of the code of ethics? I mean, obviously a lot of students feel unsafe and classes are disrupted by demonstrators all the time right now at Harvard University. So obviously you can advocate for freedom of speech, but there is a limit. Uh, if someone cam comes on campus and uh, praises Hitler and calls for killing of Jews, obviously that is, uh, uh, you know, that person crosses the line. Uh, there is a limit. Uh, a university is an educational institution, okay? And that means you need to educate people. What does it mean to educate people? It means that to tell them when they are wrong, not to allow them to say things that are harmful to other people. And obviously this is all recognized in some context of gender diversity, ethnic diversity, but not in this case of the Jews. And you ask yourself, how is that possible uh, after the Holocaust where 6 million people were killed? I mean, don't we have those sensitivities? And the provost of Harvard, Alan Garber, was sitting just behind Claudine Gay when he, she gave this testimony. So I wouldn't say that the dysfunctional leadership at Harvard uh, is just a matter of people not understanding uh, the Jewish history because there are some Jews involved in, in allowing this to happen. Like the provost of Harvard, like uh, the head of the board uh, of trustees, uh, you know, uh, Pritzker. And it shouldn't I take a Jew, right? It shouldn't take a Jew. Look, the same people, the, those same provosts, the Pritzker family, they were justifiably outraged at the uh, murder, the death of George Floyd. I remember three years ago or more. And we received on this campus, basically shut down campus. We shut down journals. We shut. We protested uh, on behalf of the you know solidarity with uh, African Americans on campuses, and that was swiftly and roundly condemned. And we had teach-ins and so forth. I, I tweeted out today, you know, thank God basically that UCSD isn't as prestigious as Harvard <laughs> or MIT because when you're at an institution like a Harvard, like a Yale, like MIT, like Penn, you have a long way down. When you are the president of that university, that Harvard, you know, I, I hate to admit it, uh, although we all know it's true. Harvard is the gold standard, okay? What happens at Harvard affects the rest of the world, not just higher education, not just the Ivy League. Just as what happens in California academically for under, uh, for students in, in schools dominates the rest of the nation because we have the biggest population. So we have the very, very uh, bright spotlight that burns on campuses. Now, but, here but, on my but, own campus, yeah. go ahead, yeah. No, I just wanted to add that, you know, even on the in the context of freedom of speech, which uh, was mentioned by the leadership of Harvard, Harvard ranks very low because there were professors yeah. who were fired for just suggesting, uh, you know, that uh, women uh, give birth uh, and, and that was considered inappropriate in the current uh, intellectual climate. But on the other hand, you know, calling for uh, the destruction of Israel and, and, and uh, genocide of Jews is not considered a deviation from what is acceptable. And if there is freedom of speech, the first group of people that should have it are tenured professors. That's the whole meaning of tenure. So how is it that there is this council culture to basically remove those who you do not agree with, including speakers uh, you know, from the other side of the political spectrum? I think that has the consequence of polarizing society even further, because at, 
a, an academic institution, you must be taught to listen, to have a dialogue with people that disagree with you. That is the fundamental uh, ethics of academia, and that is being violated. You know, I have this sense that it's just like 1984 of Orwell, where you know some people in academia are advocating for principles but are violating them by their own actions. So they are, on the one hand, virtue signaling as if they are in favor of diversity, but then anyone that disagrees with them on a, ma on a, on a particular subject is not allowed on campus. And, you know, so just like uh, George Orwell uh, mentioned the party line, uh, which basically uh, said war is peace and uh, ignorance is strength. And, you know, you, you are advocating for something and then violating it yourself. And I find that to be completely inappropriate, especially for intelligent people. I mean, you can imagine politicians doing that for political benefits, but within academia, it's just unacceptable because we are educating the next generation of leaders, you know, especially at Harvard. We, we have to show some moral compass uh, when we direct them into their adulthood. So uh, right. I really I am disappointed. It, but yeah, no, I forget who said it, but there's no, nothing that's so ludicrous that it can't be believed by the world's most intellectual individuals of which universities are a part. Now, I think universities have a special duty, as you say, because everything in, in society is downstream from universities. In other words, every journalist went to a university, every politician went to a university, every um, every you know tech worker, every every professor went to a university. We have a huge amount of leverage on society. And since the 1970s uh, and, and beyond, we've become obsessed with with, you know, what's called critical thinking and, and basically destroying a lot of what, you know, the currency that academia built up over the past hundred years. And I, I think it's I, I feel like it is a sea change when I see on campus here at UC San Diego, the ISIS flag being raised to intimidate you know, senators before a student Senate meeting, when I see, you know, people uh, needing police escorts to leave a student Senate meeting, uh, the Jewish students only. Uh, when I see well, medical the, 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 workers... The Bin Laden letter that was uh, spread around the TikTok, you just think about it, uh, where a lot of young people just argue that uh, it now makes sense, sense for what Bin Laden was saying. And, you know, that these are a corrosive... Uh, elements that will that could destroy our society they could lead to violence they could lead to a, a repetition of what the history uh, did so so badly what do you think was going through yeah. i mean to the extent that you know her at all i mean i i was disappointed i mean they all had a script they all said essentially the same thing president gay your president had an opportunity because she didn't actually wasn't president she hasn't been president for that long although she's obviously re received a ton of of, of ire, et cetera. But what do you think was going through the minds of, of the MIT president and the, and the Penn president? Why can't they, why is it so difficult? I mean, what forces would conspire? And at my graduate institution, Christina Paxton at Brown University, Ivy League as well, uh, she refused to say that, you know, uh, uh, prepared remarks in her speech, she was going to say that you should feel free to wear a kippah, a yarmulke, as well as a hijab. And she changed it because there were chants that she's, you know, a part uh, of genocide. Uh, taking, you know, benefiting from because they won't bo boycott, divest, and sanction. Now, by the way, um, would you be allowed, let's say BDS were to pass, and would you be allowed, because you do you still have dual citizenship? Or, or yes, I, I know that I my, my, my uh, colleagues would not that are in Israel. They would be forbidden to come to campus. So I find this medieval. I find this like a throwback to the dark ages. You could talk about wanting to boycott companies, fine, but to, to, to sanction and to boycott individuals, that is an anti-intellectual uh, right. pursuit, in my opinion. Also, I think, what do you think was uh, going through President Gay's mind? Yeah, You could see that the answers reflect uh, a very careful um, dance around the legal issues, uh, because if she were to admit uh, that calling for genocide uh, is inappropriate, then the next question would be, what do you do about it? And then if right. she says, OK, since it's in conflict with the code of conduct within Harvard University, we have to discipline those students. She doesn't want to go that far. And moreover, she doesn't want to be sued or legally um, because of in inaction in past events. So I think she was advised by uh, lawyers to say what she said. But that is very disappointing because leadership is all about uh, crafting your own words in a sincere, authentic fashion. 
uh, and actually following the principles that you advocate for. And what you find here is uh, a situation where universities are failing uh, to show any moral compass. And um, I'm, I'm very disappointed because that's not the environment that I was hoping for. And actually, if you think about it, before October 7, a lot of people had this illusion that uh, their friends on the left will fight for them if a situation like that uh, rises. But instead, what you see is a, a situation where, uh, you know, that you could call it anti-Semitism. I mean, you basically, uh, some people don't really care about lives of Jews. Um, and and uh, I find that amazing, you know, because some of them are actually Jews. And uh, oh, yeah. these, yeah, Many and are. so, so, uh, something is wrong, and by the way, it doesn't really just. Ex I think it's a, in a way, it looks to me like a craziness. Okay, like a loss of sanity in the context of uh, our moral compass, and uh, we need to get back to the basic principles, which is to respect everyone. And you know, I was um, under, I was at a dinner uh, in New York City hosted by Bill Ackman, and he actually is a very strong critic of Claudine Gay, but there were some Harvard faculty there. And at any event, um, uh, General Patreos uh, was speaking at that dinner. He was talking about mm. the geopolitical future of the Middle East after the Israel-Hamas war. And again, I'm emphasizing this is really the Hamas war. It's not the Palestinians. We, maybe it will be a, 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 there will be an opportunity to establish something more stable in the future after destroying the Hamas. But, uh, but at any event, uh, so he was giving his forecast, which sounded gloomy, actually. And uh, the uh, curator of the Museum of Modern Art uh, was there, and Antone uh, um, Paula Antonelli. And uh, she summarized her vision in three words. She said, love the aliens. Now, what she meant is you should love those that are different than you. And for me, you know, scientifically speaking, I actually am looking forward to an, meeting another civilization that is smarter than us because perhaps it will inspire us to do better. It's just mm -hmm. like finding a smarter student in your class. And uh, for other people, it's a threat because you want to always believe that you are the most intelligent. But you see the situation right now, we are wasting a lot of resources, effort on military conflicts uh, two trillion dollars a year by the way and if we were to direct it to space exploration we could send a space probe you know a, a cubesat towards every star in the milky way galaxy billions of them within this century it's just a matter of priorities and for some reason uh, and you know i always ask the, the, there was two months ago there was a a, a presentation of a, a play that was written by a playwright uh, uh, Josh Ravetch uh, about my research, current research. So he wrote a play that he wants to feature off Broadway in New York City. And uh, in the play, uh, the main character, which is me, uh, asks the question, why is childlike bullying more prevalent than childlike curiosity? You know, that's really the underlying problem we have, that people prefer to hate each other rather than to work together mm. towards a better future.